In this episode, you'll see me leave the boat in Hiva Oa, and you'll see me meet up with the creators of Tua Float Sailing in Tahiti. I ran into Nicole and Ryan of Tua Float Sailing. You might have seen them when they were featured on Sailing La Vagabond's YouTube channel. FSH muscular dystrophy. It's a kind of muscular dystrophy that usually affects adults. It starts in your, you know, for me in my mid-20s and it progresses in stages uh, for the rest of my life. There's no known treatment or cure. You don't always know which muscle is going to disappear next. You just know that at some point a muscle is going to start getting affected and then generally it goes away pretty quickly when that happens. So, so far I've lost the muscles in my chest, my abs, some in my face. Um, you can see in my bicep, this is flexing as hard as I can right now, and there's almost nothing left there anymore. My forearms are really strong so far, but I've lost a lot of the muscles, lost almost all the muscles actually in my thighs and lately in my hamstrings. Calves are gone. When I try to raise up my arm, I can only raise it this high. This is as hard as I can strain. I can use my other arm to push it up, like if I need to wash my hair or something like that, but then when I let go, it drops back down to this level. And that's because there's no muscles here holding against my scapula to give me something to leverage against. The other arm I can hold a little bit higher, but not much higher. Um, I can throw my arm up. So if I'm trying to do work on something overhead, you know, I could throw my arm up like this and grab on and then sometimes throw my other arm and with a combination of the two, turn a screw or undo a light bulb or whatever it is. Uh, underway, the challenges I face a lot have to do with stability without having a strong core with having weakening legs, especially when you start getting tired on a multi-day passage, oftentimes my legs will crumble and I'll end up slamming against the lifelines or against, you know, part of the cabin down below. So I'm almost, I, I am always clipped into the boat when I'm on deck, even in calm weather. We both do that just because it's, it's a philosophy. Even in that, a cockpit or? Oh, especially in the cockpit. Yeah. Especially in the cockpit. Uh, we always wear, we have Spinlock PFDs. They're extremely comfortable. They have a built-in harness. You don't even really know they're on. I don't see any reason. To, to not wear one, there's no detriment at all. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a rule on our boat. We have to, on when we're out of the marina, we have to have our life jackets on. I love that. I respect that tremendously. Um, down below, or when I'm moving around anywhere, just like anybody on a boat, you have to kind of hold on and, and so forth. But for me, I think it's maybe one step more important. Like I have to use that to even be able to get up out of the seat or move around. Um, our watch schedule is modified slightly. Generally, Nicole takes longer watches at night, uh, bigger blocks, which then allows me to have um, a little bit more sleep. And in an exchange, I handle a little bit more of the, of the technical stuff. Um, so it kind of, it, it balances out. We found That makes sense to me. Like any captain would kind of need to probably a little more time, especially if you have a two person watch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's great being interviewed by you because you've got experience in the open ocean and you understand, you know, that, that this isn't uh, just sailing up and down the coast, you know. So in terms of muscular dystrophy, diet is really important for me. It's a little challenging sometimes when you're at sea for two or three weeks and you don't have any more fresh food left and you start eating more breads and things like that, uh, which tend to cause me to feel less uh, strong and, and, and my muscles to fatigue much more quickly than if I was eating a lot of vegetables and lean proteins and, and, and such. Avoid sugars, avoid alcohol. Maybe feel slightly off, really slam it into me like a, like a truck. What's your sailing background before you went on this big trip? I know Ryan has a lot. He has a lot and I have very little, had very little. Um, in college, uh, I taught uh, sailing to little kids and little dinghies and that was pretty much the extent of my sailing experience except when I would go with Ryan but I never really did much work at the helm. Um, I had a huge learning curve when we left Mexico. I, we worked for two years so hard on our boat. Any spare time we had, we, were, we installed everything ourselves um, that we didn't get to take her, Naoma out that, that much in practice. So I was extremely rusty. And uh, so it was, it was a challenging first uh, couple months, but uh, my learning curve just went whoosh. And now I'm a lot better, especially um, at all the foredeck anchoring stuff. All right, so you are the anchor person. Yes, All yes, right. I'm the anchor person. And he's a pal, but I think, you know, 
It's probably reversed on my boat because my wife likes to helm more than I do. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> but when, when I have new crew, I, I helm. So. <coughs> Brian's just really good at, at the helm. And we have our signals with each other. We can do it without saying anything to each other, just through signals. So we have that communication. But yeah, I think anchoring is one of our strengths, usually, not wood. Yeah, in the propane video, actually, we, we dragged, and it was a pretty significant drag. We didn't cover it a lot in the video because it was hard to show, but right behind us, we had a reef that was kind of like a lee shore, and the winds were, were gusting stronger and stronger. I, I showed that part in the video. I forget, up to 20 knots, I think, around. But um, the, the bottom there is really deep, and it's sort of a mix of sand and it's kind of rock, so it's not really Grass. good holding. Lots of vegetation. Not where we were. Was there? Yeah, well, the tons of vegetation. There you go, the the person at the bow. Yeah. You know, the oh, yeah. Like. So three to one scope. Yeah, you're on like a three hold. to one scope in 80 feet of water, and you've got almost all your line and your chain out. Yeah. And uh, the wind switches direction, so now you're opposite the way that your anchor was set. And the bottom's got vegetation and a rock. A bit of vegetation. It had tons of vegetation. <laughs> After I chatted with Nicole and Ryan, the full interview you can hear on the Slow Boat Sailing podcast. I needed to get some special propane attachments. The propane attachments in French Polynesia are very different than they use in the United States and are not available for purchase in Hivaoa. All right, so I'm at the Ace and Papite, which is uh, just uh, downtown. You just keep on staying close to the waterfront uh, if you're walking east then, or walk it west then you keep it to your left uh, the this is the adapter hopefully this adapter will work I'm a bit more skeptical about the others this is pretty expensive like uh, over twenty dollars I got another adapter that was uh, female I don't think that's the right one and that was like thirty five dollars but you never know what will work and we really need propane the Tahiti Airport Motel. So this is just right across the street from the airport. Uh, you can see it when you get through baggage claim. You just kind of walk up the hill, go through a few crosswalks where the cars uh, will probably stop for you. So yesterday I worked on getting uh, Vinny SIM cards, the data cards. You can't get the data cards in Hiva Oa. Uh, I I went to the post office in Hivoa a couple days ago and the only data SIM cards they had uh, were uh, too big for the iPhone so they don't have the, the little tiny SIM cards, they have kind of big ones so I don't know what kind of phones those work on. Probably the closest uh, place to get SIM cards, there might be a place in the airport. I went to the Carrefour which is a grocery store. Uh, which is the it basically lead store in uh, a kind of American style mall uh, and uh, where the Carrefour is is a, a Vinny store and the, the lady who helped me spoke English and for about twenty dollars US you could get a data SIM card topped up with 500 megabytes and then the additional top-ups are about 400 megabytes uh, and that gets you uh, for 20 so for about $20 or uh, 2,000 CFP. Edie Airport Motel is a pretty nice hotel. Uh, did I see a cockroach? Yeah, I did. Uh, but you might see a few cockroaches in your time here in French Polynesia. Uh, was the room perfect? No, it was very good, but there were cracks and things like that that they could have uh, remodeled the room. Uh, so it, it probably deserves its more three-ish star rating. It's definitely not a four star. If you want to stay at the Intercontinental, you're going to pay a lot more. Uh, so, uh, but it's also more expensive than a pension. Uh, so you could save a lot of money going to a, a pension. Free breakfast here. Uh, so I thought it worked for me. Uh, if I had more time to stay, I might try a pension. Uh, but hopefully next time I'll be here for a long time, I'll be on my boat. 
and it seems that uh, a lot of boats anchor pretty near the airport uh, here. Polynesians take their lays and flowery headdresses really seriously. Uh, a lot of people at Hivo, uh, uh, locals, uh, were wearing uh, the lays and headdresses, and it just smells wonderful. These are really ornate, uh, well done uh, flower uh, decorations. And uh, so, if you go into fly into Hawaii, you know you'll see kind of plastic stuff but uh, nothing of the quality that you can get uh, in uh, Tahiti or uh, uh, the Marquesas or the other parts of French Polynesia. So these re real flower lays are very reasonable. The lady that sold me this one sold it to me for uh, 400 which is the current exchange rate, something like 360 So it's a pretty good deal, 400 CFP. We're going to do a lot better uh, than the Bureau de Change uh, by going to the ATMs or cash points uh, in the airport. It shows the bank Sucredo. Uh, you'll get a much better rate uh, from the ATMs than exchanging actual bills. So this is the big ship that uh, needs all the turning radius within uh, Hiva Oa's Tahuaka Bay. So I'm in front of the luggage storage. Uh, one of the things is a lot of the flights back to the U.S. and probably a lot of other international destinations are overnight flights. And uh, you have to check out, say, noon or 11 o'clock, in my case, your hotel. Uh, you can store your bags in the luggage storage right here uh, near the international departures. So even if your plane is not uh, open to check bags, you can have a place to, to store your bags so you can move about around town. After spending many hours in this airport, uh, one thing will come to mind is there is no air conditioning anywhere in the departure lounge. It's all open air, except for one place is the atrium, but not where you eat it is where you check out. So you get in there, you're like, you found heaven, you buy the food, and then you realize there's no place to eat the food except outside in the open air. So this is outside, and the other part of the atrium lounge is outside too, so. Uh, I had to go back to the hotel uh, just to get some air conditioning and find an outlet. There are also no outlets here, so if you're running low on batteries, you need to go someplace else. The airport is probably not the place for you. The air conditioning is in there, but you can't stay there too long. The only electrical outlet is by the little kitty rides. At around midnight, it was time to fly back to LAX and return to the USA for the first time in a month. Subscribe and share <laughs> and like, like the video. <laughs> bye bye.